Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. Here you can grow your knowledge about marketing operations, listen to ideas and strategies to help you scale, grow, and optimize your efficiency, drive your speed to market, and enrich your work life. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. I'm Glenn Bottomley, and today my guest is Alyssa Nixon, Vertical Marketing and Operations Manager at Siemens, a technology company focused on combining the real and the digital worlds to empower customers to transform their industries and markets to then transform the everyday for billions of people. Thanks for joining us today, Alyssa. Thanks for having me, Glenn. Happy to be well, here. Well, I am so happy that you are here. And I know that one of the things when we chatted before that you are passionate about is that marketers knowing how to effectively utilize a go-to-market strategy by using an integrated marketing mix. So help us out here. What's the beginning steps to start that process? Yeah, well, definitely strategy is very important. Um, And so I think the beginning of the strategy, bringing everybody together, um, the right subject matter experts um, paired with the right uh, communications experts um, is going to be really key to your success. Um, but then also creating some form of foundation there. Um, and so foundation, I mean, within the strategy, you want to make sure that you have a key visual, a key message but also that you're taking a look at the business or the solution or whatever you need to sell as a whole. Um, Because what some people, uh, I guess, get confused with is the difference between marketing and advertising and communications, but they really all kind of have to work together if you want a successful outcome. And so bringing all the right people in the room at the same time to kind of workshop a good strategy is probably the beginning stage of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, coming up let's, that foundation. I love that. The dig into that a little bit further. So let's let, and let's focus in on say com, you know communication side with sort of traditional marketing. So how do you how do you do it? Where do you start? And what's been your experience on the best way to do that? Yeah. So. Definitely how you can navigate the difference is on the marketing side of things, whenever you're kind of looking at a business and the growth of the business and where you need to be selling, you have to do a lot of upfront work called discovery, um, where you're, you're essentially kind of doing a lot of research on the competitors. What are the competitors even advertising or marketing in? Um, but also looking at the different shares the market shares um, that your product or solution could hold. Um, And then also looking up even at a higher scale, what region um, you would typically need to sell in as well. So kind of establishing your parameters is a big part of the marketing side. Now, when you get into the communication side, that is taking your plan. So your, your strategy that has your parameters Um, your target audience, your target profiles, your buyer personas and all that, and actually creating a plan. How are you going to talk to your customers? What's the go-to market strategy from there? So how can I take this that I've come up with and actually implement it? Um, And that's when somebody in communications can really come in and create a good plan. Um, And that's where the integrated mix marketing mix also comes into play where you're taking your current assets that you have. Maybe it's like a white paper or even an industry article that gave you um, the market analysis, you know, the intelligence there. And then the communications person is going to be really key in diving deeper into the marketing um, data, but then kind of translating it for uh, a different type of audience, somebody that's maybe not so technical, um, and they can put it out into different channels and um, really create a full circle campaign. 
Yeah, and to your point, it it, uh, it may be someone who is uh, not technical, or to your point, if it was a technology product that you were marketing to someone very technical, obviously customizing to what you're saying is not only customizing to the buyer, but to the geography, to the type of product they're using. And it's it's it feels like what I'm hearing you say is just the importance of deeply understanding your buyer, uh, what motivates them, how, what is their uh, the, the way in which they communicate, the type of language that they use, their level of technical sophistication or understanding, um, and utilizing and leveraging that whether you are introducing a product or some product service uh, or something to create this sort of integrated approach with the the customer or their buyer always at the center. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've kind of done, um, at my previous job. So I, I'm at Siemens now, but when I was at Siemens energy, we had to do a lot of testing in the oil and gas space. Um, the difference between global and regional, um, for our solutions, especially offshore, it's very hard to kind of, you know, make solutions sexy that, involve oil and gas in general. Um, but one of the topics that was new and up and coming was for offshore um, floating wind, um, or it was for a uh, top sides campaign where um, it's, it's to for solutions for offshore drilling rigs, for example. And we, we tried different methods. So we use the same, you know, key visual key message, but then we decided to partner with a pub to help us really tap into um, their target audience and um, their profiles that kind of gelled, you know, well with ours, what we were going after. Um, and so we did a global approach with the campaign. And then we also did a really targeted approach targeting Norway specifically um, to kind of see the difference in traction and always, you know, making sure to tie in what a, a a call to action with that. So um, everything was kind of driving to the same place. Um, we were just using simply different regions. And sure enough, we found out that that one particular solution got way better traction um, just going straight through Norway, you know, versus globally. So it really depends on what your, your goal is. You know, do you want to do an inbound campaign or do you want to do more demand gen? Sometimes you have to start with inbound to go demand gen. As yeah, well. so in a sense, it, you're almost doing A B testing, but at a country level. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? You're literally testing one market versus another, as opposed to necessarily one campaign versus another, which I'm sure you do yeah. too. But but this is in a sense, it's almost like I'm testing this country and the acceptance of a product or service in the country and testing it against this other geographic region or country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To really find this sweet spot, you know, what, act and then it lets us know also, you know, what activities were going on too, even during the time period. Um, so you can go even deeper when you're doing the testing um, to kind of see what that looks like. You can look within the regions of Norway, um, but yeah, we, we won't get into all of that. <laughs> yeah, but to your point, yeah, because yeah, because I can I can definitely envision what you're describing because Norway might have you know pockets of, you know, this might be a, an area that's more advanced. This might be an area that's less advanced. And so, but the amalgam of all of that might generate, hey, this country is going to perform better, you know, with this product than this other country, because it's, it's, it, it's, it's the makeup or the composition of all of the various sub markets inside that country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's been your experience then in terms of timing? Um, because I would think that it's one thing to test off one country versus another. It's another to hit it at the right time when acceptance could be high uh, or there's a technology shift or a market shift or a competitive shift. Um, so how do you sort of bring timing and overlay timing on top of your marketing operations functions? Yeah. So I think definitely timing is everything. Um, and, and that includes, you know, what events are going on, do you have any good stories that you can talk about? Um, and are customers willing to come on air and talk about those uh, great success stories too? Um, but then also is the location of the event that has all this traction, is it actually a good location? You know, are a lot of customers going to want to go to this location? 
Um, so all of those are going to be really key, I think. Um, and it doesn't even have to be like a full blown conference. Um, sometimes like what I've done before is I, I hosted just a press event um, at uh, we had at my previous job, we had a um, locally a place called the Digi Hub, and we host customers there pretty regularly. Um, but we were launching a new um, solution that was pretty, you know, it was game changing um, and so much that we could even, you know, we pre-programmed everyone's emails that was involved in the press so that whenever they showed up, you know, and actually experienced the demonstration, they got a notification right away. But we did a lot of things up until that point, like actually submitting for award shows locally. Um, and then we had our site ready to go. We had a campaign that was running. We had a, a geo-targeted campaign running in the Texas area. And we actually won, or we were up for nominations for some of the awards. And some of the pubs that um, were supporting the awards were actually already invited to this press event. And that, that was just, I think, by luck, actually. Um, we got really lucky with the timing of everything. Um, but yeah, making sure that, you know, one, there's a lot of activity happening in that area. So you can kind of build off the momentum and stay relevant. But then also you want to make sure the right people are in the room too, or that you're targeting the right profiles. Um, because I think you could, you could still miss the mark if you're not, um, you're not going after you know, your parameters still. Mm -hmm. um, and by yeah, pubs, you mean, and by, in pubs, you mean publications? Publications. Yes. Yeah. Right. So the importance of bringing in media, news mm -hmm. channels, the, you know, that, that angle of it uh, to yeah. promote and cross promote and, you know, drive further uh, promotion because exactly. that's, a, it, it's, it's an interesting description of, a go-to-market communication strategy. And I'd be curious about your point of view on this because when you think about the importance of the integrated marketing strategy, it, you've got, as you just mentioned a moment ago, you know, you're loading in all the email addresses. You've got, you know, both the digital side, et cetera. But how do you bring in sort of the physical marketing? So in other words, you know, you have all the digital, you're bringing in the publications, you've got news, you've got media, you've got social, you've got all these things. But how do you generally bring in other physical marketing impressions, whether it be, you know, promotional items, um, signage, uh, booths at these events that you talk about, direct mail, uh, marketing brochures? How, talk to us a little bit about how you bring that into your integrated strategies. Yeah. So I definitely think that is a huge part also of the integrated media mix. Um, but the key is, to really have a unified message. Um, and that's kind of how you really tie everything together. Um, that's why I always lead with, you need a key visual, a key message. Um, you need to be able to talk about what you're gonna sell within six words. Um, and so, and that's your headline right there, you know? Um, so I think having a very clear message, um, value proposition, visual, um, and then some, you know, maybe some spinoff campaigns of that, but they all kind of tie in together um, is going to be your key to integrating all of that. Um, I think another another key element, too, is making sure that the content that's going to be shown within the booth itself um, is also aligning with with your messaging and all of that. Um, and you stay away from being too product focused. Um, I come from a background of product advertising, so it was hard for me to kind of transition and learn that. But my brand management side really kind of helped learn and teach me kind of how to keep the brand integrity of, you know, the message and everything. So you have one cohesive look and one company versus like all these random business units, you know, firing on different cylinders. Yeah. And I, my experience also is that when companies do this really, really well, it just feels, um, it just feels natural. It feels, 
Um, like everything just flows. Uh, I was doing some brand research the other day into uh, Tesla, uh, the electric uh, vehicle company. And one of the things that is all over all of their documentation, uh, marketing brochures, even in their uh, public filings, uh, is this notion about how Tesla is helping to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. And it's a simple phrase, but it not only hits all of their, of course, their electric vehicles, but their, you know, solar panel, uh, you know, all of those other products. So it's like when you get that right to your comment, when you get that right theme that becomes that overarching, simple, clear message, it just can come off very, very natural, very, very simple. And it sounds like you've had a lot of experience in not only generating that, but then leveraging that, you know, all the way down throughout your, you know, not only the marketing mix, but all the way down through the, the tenure of that life, uh, the life of that product or service. Would you agree? Yes. Like, and it shows, because you want to make sure that the customers recognize what you're trying to sell, but they don't want to feel bombarded by it either. You know, they, they don't want to feel like the customers do not come to buy products. They come to buy solutions. Um, and so I think that's something really key that a lot of people forget about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, somebody, uh, shared with me, and this is, you probably have heard this is that, um, uh, let's say you were a, um, uh, a hardware manufacturer and you were selling a drill. Um, you're not actually selling the drill. What you're selling is the hole that's in the wall. And because the problem that they're trying, they're, what they want to achieve is they want to put a hole in the wall so that they can hang up a, you know, a, a, a picture or what have you. So they don't buy the drill because they want to buy a drill. They buy the drill because they want to get a hole in the wall so that they can hang up this and achieve this goal, whatever it is that they're doing. So um, I think I align with what you're describing there really 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. So then in your experience, what is the best way then to how an organization in this environment, they've got the, they've got that overarching vision and communication uh, guiding principle statement uh, that is market facing. Uh, but then they have the media mix. You talked about the publications, but now let's talk about social, advertising, print, uh, digital, obviously, newspaper, um, so many different aspects and avenues that a, a marketing operations team can take mm -hmm. uh, to drive that message home. So what's been your experience about either allocation of funding to those multiple resources and channels? Um, how do you squeeze out the value uh, across all of those various channels that you could choose? Yeah. So definitely that's a huge thing coming from agency and going client side. Um, I think that helped me a little bit, actually learn um, how to argue for the value because that's um, a lot of people in marketing and operations. We kind of tend to have to prove, you know, the value of um, like why a display ad got you impressions or what the impressions meant. Um, and so I think that, Definitely making sure you have a, a good proposal, like a plan in place as to how the different channels will work together. Um, so going back to the media mix, you know, if we have a white paper as a base, how can I stretch that white paper? Um, so can I repurpose this white paper into a brochure that could also be downloaded on the website? Um, can I take the brochure um, and also pass it out at shows? Um, can the white paper be repurposed for editorial or case studies? Can we pitch that to editorial? Um, can we do a media buy with an agency um, with the article also that we just created from the white paper? Um, mm -hmm. So kind of seeing how far you can stretch the dollars um, by keeping the same messaging. So always keeping the same key visual as your hero image, the key message, um, and your, your good key headline. Obviously, it could um, adjust based on the type of campaign you want to run. So if you're doing something that's more you know, awareness driven, um, you might be doing quite a bit more of like email marketing, um, display 
ads, um, posting display ads everywhere, that's desktop and mobile. Um, and then also utilizing social media, um, but it's gonna be very high level. And then there's that layer down where you're trying to do a more lead generation approach, um, which you can run at the same time, but you have to really rely on the parameters that I talked about previously, you know, for the lead generation campaign. Um, and that's hitting, you know, all the different elements. So marketing automation tools, um, you can also utilize account-based marketing as well. Um, so there's a lot of different channels that you can use to stretch um, your dollars. Um, but sometimes it, it all it's all customizable. It comes down to, you know, what solution are you trying to sell? Um, and does it need to be, you know, awareness or more, you know, demand gen, lead generation focused? Yeah. And this uh, implied in what you were just describing was, uh, is attribution as well. And, and like you said, the, the ROI of your efforts, because if you create some content piece and then you can wring that out and use it in four different locations um, or elements of it, you know, this is going to go over on this video or that's going to go on YouTube or this is on, on LinkedIn or this is going over here or I'm going to use this at a trade show giveaway. Um, those great, you know, you're doing the work once and you, the, the longer term value, uh, is really helping you throughout the process. But then what I also kind of gleaned from what you were describing is that that actually, uh, that actually becomes a very interesting way, uh, of, cause each one of those have a different contribution. You might not know what, what it is, but it'll have a different contribution to, uh, a conversion because, you know, LinkedIn might have an extremely top of funnel uh, type of, uh, you know, uh, impact to your to your um, marketing mix. But it might, you know, the YouTube might, for whatever reason, drive more conversion, you know, for you. But you just did that work. And so by having it out there in multiple locations, it also, it kind of increases the probability uh, yes. that conversion, that, that conversion act could actually happen. Would you especially, agree? Especially, yes, especially if you're driving also to the same site. So I think that's really key. Um, you want to keep your user on the same one landing page and try to not get them off the page. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of companies like to put multiple links on pages, but y your goal is to get that person to go all the way down the page and want more. And so essentially, in my mind, the campaigns that I just talked about, um, when you drive to the site, you're filling out an input form. You know, there's some way that we can gate that content to actually see who went all the way through or they're clicking on a video and watching it. So any way that we can get them to interact on the page is going to be the best um, return of investment, um, essentially. But then on the show floor, that's a totally different level of lead generation, you know, because you have to collect it on site or I guess get them to fill out an input form there, but right or scan a badge or scan something. Scan a badge, yeah, exactly, exactly. But I could tell you, like some customer events, if you want to compare, like like trade shows are great, and I don't want to dog on trade shows, but customer events, if you can do a really good one and have the right people in there, you can make you know your dollars go crazy far. I mean, I've yeah. seen POs get signed at the event, so yeah. it just it's all about. Yeah, how targeted you are and how far you can stretch the dollars. Well, and also being able to sometimes, you know, back to your comment about the events, inviting uh, a major subject matter expert or a leader in the industry or some luminary, inviting them to speak at a customer event. And then, you know, you and your team are all there, you know, sales teams are there, marketing teams are there answering questions after that, you know, those are, those are all really great legion, you know, um, you know, opportunities for you. I think that's great. Um, but Alyssa, one of the things that I find is, is really interesting about your background is in addition to all of your for-profit experience, uh, in your career, you also have a ton of nonprofit experience as well. Uh, so, can you just share a little bit about what are some of the biggest differences that you found uh, working in marketing operations for a nonprofit versus a for-profit organization? And what did you sort of learn and, and sort of take away from those multiple, you know, experiences? Yeah. Um, so right now, uh, so I, I work in, I guess, three, mul 
three nonprofits um, at this time. Um, I sit on the founding board of the Society for Low Carbon Technology. Um, and on that side, currently, I'm more of a functional leader and um, I do strategic marketing. So I'm working with the group um, and it's a little bit more established, less uh, it, and it's nonprofit. We, we don't take a profit from it. We donate back to uh, more like on a mentorship basis. We'll donate scholarships, that kind of thing. Now, this other one with Red M, um, which is to combat human sex trafficking. Um, so it's all a bunch of industry leaders. Um, it's completely nonprofit as well, but we have a ton of volunteers, which is just amazing. But because um, sometimes uh, when you have a lot of volunteers and a lot of passionate, you know, there's not a lot of, we, we currently are developing, you know, what the red end structure looks like, um, what the leadership structure looks like. Um, and I'm on the leadership team, but I was tasked to also chair or co-chair because I, I made sure to co-chair this event because I'd never done a nonprofit event before. Um, called a Scottish Night to Remember um, with my partner, uh, Fernando Hernandez, who is a global Scot and the business ambassador to Scotland. And he kind of mentored me through that process. Um, but I think the operations side is very important in a nonprofit. I had to take my marketing hat off and go full blown operations, business development, um, because there's so many different personalities and so many people raising their hands. And so I had to come up with a structure right away. Um, we, we threw a great volunteer outreach party, um, got lots of people to sign their name down on what they wanted. But before we even did that, we had a structure in place. Um, you know, we had a marketing team, an experience team, a sponsorship gathering team, exhibition team. And then myself and Fernando were kind of at the top um, working together. But then below that, you know, there we had about 30 to 50 volunteers. Um, so and it was it was a big event. Um, and so I think you have to really do a lot more of the management side um, and, and making sure that the pieces are all coming together. We actually raised over $10,000 that night um, and didn't use a dime of Red M's money. And all of that was done um, through organic social media and a few and a little bit of newsletters. But it was crazy. We didn't we didn't spend a dime on um, media at all. Nothing. Wow. Impressive. So, Impressive. Yeah. I was like, holy cow, how did we do this? But I think it was because we had such a good structure. And we were constantly in communication. Um, so fingers crossed we can do better for next year. Um, but yeah, it was that was probably one of the most rewarding things. Mm, it sounds like it. Well, Alyssa, before we wrap up today's episode, what is the main takeaway that you want to share to help understand the challenges that are facing marketing operations executives today? Yeah, I think um, a key takeaway is you know making sure like i said that you have a really good solid foundation and that's really where your operations hat comes in to play and then a good strategy and a good proposal because um, to like glenn what you're saying your point you know how can we stretch the dollars what's the return of investment um so really making sure that you have a foundation before you just go out there and start advertising away <laughs> I think that's great. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Art of Marketing Operations. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alyssa. Thank you, Glenn, for having me. Well, until next time, stay safe and take care. Thank you for listening to the Art of Marketing Operations brought to you by Taylor. Don't forget to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review and share. Until next time.